Hello friends, I am Dr. Shonali and uh, yet again another year we will begin with our uh, discussion of the subject wide test series for um, obstetrics and gynecology. Now uh, how we will go about this test paper is um, again like last time we will try to club similar uh, topics as much as possible so that we can do a good chunk of questions together. The goal is to cover as much important topics as much as possible in this uh, discussion and um, uh, we will be looking at the questions first answering them and then going about the going about the various uh, important points about that particular topic all right so let us see here question number one when you read question number one it says obstetric nerve palsy associated in puperium causes which of the following all right now the correct answer for this question is d foot drop Foot drop is the correct answer. Now let me just give you important bits about the nerve injuries in obstetrics and why does this foot drop happen? This foot drop happens because of the common peroneal nerve. Okay, common peroneal nerve injury during the puperium and this can happen during the puperium why because of the compression of the pelvic nerves the part that gets compressed is the common peroneal nerve and also the compression in the stirrups compression during the positioning of the uh, female in a way that the nerve is compressed uh, you know uh, below the thigh in stirrups so let us just note some important points about the obstetric nerve palsies and which are the obstetric nerve palsies that we should remember about important one is if i ask you which is the most common during pregnancy and puperium okay the most common during pregnancy and puperium is the common peroneal nerve okay common peroneal nerve and this causes foot drop like the question that was asked this leads to foot drop other than that another obstetric nerve palsy you should remember is the lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh that is injured during the McRoberts maneuver McRoberts maneuver in shoulder dystocia all right then the third that you should remember is the ilioinguinal nerve the ilioinguinal nerve can sometimes be damaged in the lateral extension of the fan and steel incision lateral extension of fanal steel incision during cesarean section okay so sometimes this ilioinguinal nerve can also be damaged by the lateral extension of fanal steel incision during cesarean section this is about the obstetric nerve palsies now let us i have two other nerves which are uh, in gynae surgeries or nerves of importance in gynae one is the genitofemoral nerve this is one important nerve genitofemoral nerve and this nerve gets damaged is damaged or prone to damage prone to damage during internal iliac lymph node dissection in gynae cancer surgeries so this nerve is prone to damage in that situation all right in the limb internal iliac art internal iliac lymph node dissection in gynae cancer surgeries the genitofemoral nerve can get damaged there and second important point is the obturator obturator nerve in the ovarian fossa 
okay this can be damaged or this can be involved in advanced ovarian cancers all right in advanced ovarian cancers there can be involvement of the obturator nerve and that can lead to referred pain referred pain in the hip and knee joint in case of advanced ovarian cancers all right another important nerve that you should remember in obsgai is the pudendal nerve all right so pudendal nerve just remember that we give the pudendal nerve block we give the pudendal nerve block in obstetrics and uh, it this block takes care of the lower part of vagina and the vulva okay this gets anesthetized lower part of vagina and vulva by this pudendal nerve block and this is given at the level of ischial spines so these are the important points to remember about the various nerves that we encounter in the obstetrics and gynae discussions all right so these are the major nerves and their importances and i have clubbed them all together for you here so uh, this is there now let us go through question number 2 what is the ph of the amniotic fluid now the ph of the amniotic fluid here is we know that it is alkaline and even in alkaline it is more towards the neutral side it is not excessively alkaline so it is 7.1 to 7.3 is the correct answer of question number 2 amniotic fluid is a very important topic as far as your exams is concerned they have asked a number of questions on amniotic fluid and various aspects of amniotic fluid have been asked so let me just give you a brief about what are the important points in amniotic fluid that you should remember so when we're talking about amniotic fluid what are the additional points that you should remember in amniotic fluid regarding amniotic fluid so the first point is about the we'll talk about the characteristics characteristics of amniotic fluid certain important characteristics then we have to talk about the production and then we have to talk about the abnormalities okay they have asked questions on all of these three points and this is important now as far as the characteristics are concerned we did right now that the ph is around 7.1 to 7.3 another important point is that it is the osmolality the osmolality is around 260 milli osmol per liter what is important to remember is that it is hypo osmolar to the it is hypo osmolar as compared to the maternal or fetal blood okay second important point is that the water in the it is 99% water and this water is replaced once in every 3 hours okay it gets replaced once in every 3 hours so it is 8 times a day this water gets replaced and the turnover rate turnover rate of amniotic fluid at term is around 500 to 800 ml per 24 hours this is another important point to remember so these are the characteristics that they ask about all right the ph the osmolality they have asked all these questions in recent exams the water content the it is majority of the content is water and the turnover rate of amniotic fluid at term next important point about amniotic fluid to remember is the color of the amniotic fluid so they have asked about the 
color of the amniotic fluid. So you should remember that the normal colored is straw colored. This is straw colored at term. Okay. And it is colorless in preterm. Okay, the more preterm it is, the colorless the liquor is, the more near term it is, it becomes straw colored. Another important point is what happens in post term. In post term or post maturity, it becomes saffron colored. Saffron colored or greenish yellow. Right? Then the other important thing is golden. Golden colored amniotic fluid is seen in RH incompatibility. Dark colored. Or blood stained. That is seen in abruption. Then we have to remember that the dark brown or tobacco colored, tobacco juice like that is seen in IUD. Very, very important. What about the green colored amniotic fluid? Now, this green colored amniotic fluid can be seen very importantly in meconium. When the baby passes meconium, it can be seen in fetal distress. It can also be seen in post maturity. Sometimes in post mature infant can also pass uh, meconium. And again important point is that it can be seen in maternal listeriosis infection. Alright, so this is what is important about the amniotic fluid. Very, very important point. When is the amniotic fluid maximum? It is maximum. Amniotic fluid is maximum in 32 to 34 weeks. Between 32 to 34 weeks. Very important point to remember. Amniotic fluid has various functions like it prevents the... Um, it maintains the normal temperature around the baby and it also uh, is like a, acts like a shock absorber. It has protective functions for the fetus, allows the fetus to grow inside, gives it enough space and mobility and all that. But what is important to remember that it has no nutritive function. Okay, so this is an important point that amniotic fluid has no nutritive function. This is the important point. All right. Next important bit is that you have to remember is about the production. When we talk about amniotic fluid production, we say amniotic fluid production, we say that in the first 12 weeks, it is formed by the ultrafiltrate. It is formed by the ultrafiltrate of maternal plasma. Okay, between 12 to 20 weeks, it is formed by the contribution is across the as transudate. Transudate across fetal skin. All right, but if they ask you this question that when is keratinization, when does keratinization of fetal skin takes place? Then the keratinization of fetal skin takes place between 22 to 25 weeks. Okay, so this is a little bit of difference here that the keratinization of fetal skin takes place 22 to 25 days. This has been asked, and in the second trimester between 12 to 20 weeks, it is mainly as transudate across fetal skin. Importantly, Fetal urine is the major contributor beyond 18 weeks. So beyond 18 weeks, it is fetal urine. And this can be as much as 1000 ml per day at term is the amount of urine production by the fetus. All right. But if they ask you this question that when, fe when fetus forms first urine, when fetus starts forming urine. So these are two different 
points you should remember that amniotic fluid contribution of fetal urine is major is majorly beyond 18 weeks okay but if they ask you frame the question in a different language saying that when fetus first starts forming urine when fetus first starts forming urine then the answer to that question is 12 weeks all right but if they ask you when does fetal urine contributes when the fetal urine significantly starts contributing to amniotic fluid then that for that the answer is beyond 18 weeks so this is one thing is important all right then the second thing that is important that you have to remember is that so fetal urine contributes to this thing and fetal swallowing fetal swallowing also uh, you know leads to resorption of amniotic fluid so fetus so one is fetal urine one is fetus swallow so fetal swallowing leads to resorption of amniotic fluid resorption of amniotic fluid and this contributes to around 750 ml takes away 750 ml of fetus swallows about 750 ml of amniotic fluid per day all right so fetal urine contributes 1000 ml per day at term and a term this is also at term fetus swallows around 750 ml of amniotic fluid per day at term all right so what are the important bits that you have to remember about the amniotic fluid abnormalities is what is called as two situations which is called as polyhydramnios and one is called as oligohydramnios okay most common cause of mild polygohyd polyhydramnios is actually idiopathic all right if they ask you what is the abnormality then the most common is cleft uh, cleft lip and palate palate which has defective swallowing and everything so most common becomes git and abnormalities more than the neural tube defect this is an important point to remember that in polyhydramnios the most common cause is idiopathic after that it is cleft lip or cleft palate so most common is git abnormalities and then there is neural tube defects on the other hand with oligohydramnios the causes are iugr the causes can be hypertension the causes can be post term you know the causes very importantly renal agenesis you have to remember that renal agenesis and any renal abnormalities because there will be no fetal urination those will cause even posterior urethral valve so things that are affecting with situations that are affecting with fetal urination or urine production are going to lead to oligohydramnios right whereas anything that is affecting the fetal swallowing right that is going to lead to polyhydramnios excessive fetal urination or polyuria like that seen in diabetes maternal diabetes that will also called as that will also cause polyhydramnios right then the other important thing to remember is that there is a syndrome which is called as potter syndrome there is a syndrome which is called as potter syndrome that is seen with oligohydr seen oligohydramnios as a part of that potter syndrome that is bilateral renal agenesis and because of that there is severe oligohydramnios there is there are limb contractures there is compressed face abnormal facies compressed face and there is pulmonary hypoplasia so this constellation of uh, uh, findings with bilateral renal agenesis is called as potter's syndrome now this is an important point to remember all right so this uh, is what you have to remember about amniotic fluid very important topic let me emphasize that again beginning from the characteristics the color of the amniotic fluid and the production of the amniotic fluid the important bits i have summarized here this is a must remember topic all right
and the abnormalities about what conditions can cause polyhydramnios, what conditions can cause oligohydramnios, because usually they will ask questions in this uh, in a manner like all of these causes polyhydramnios except so you know you'll have to eliminate about the, uh, about eliminate a few of the options there and then come back come to a reasonable choice of answer. Now let us uh, move on to the next question. Question number three. All right. Question number three, female complaints uh, of infertility, HSG is showing what? Now this is a simple uh, figure which says that this is a, the answer to this question, it is a unicorn weight uterus, all right? Because we see that the dye is in, the we see the dye, this is the leech Wilkinson's cannula, okay, very importantly, which is uh, another question that we can answer from this here is what, uh, which cannula is used? which cannula is used usually the cannula that is used is called as leech wilkinson's cannula okay this is the cannula that is used the dye that is a radio opaque dye is inserted and we can see that the dye is traveling only on one side and then this is the one-sided uterus and that is developing from one side of the mullerian duct and the other side there is no dye going on to the other side and then this is the tube and this is the dry coming out of the tube so this is a uniconvate uterus most likely it is a uniconvate uterus all right however this will have to be confirmed by a laparoscopy and a hysteroscopy nonetheless so there is no other there is no other part of the mullerian duct uh, paramullerian uh, sorry paramesonephric duct that is developing or the mullerian duct that is developing all right so this is the unicornuate uterus now let us talk about some important points that you have to remember about we're talking about the mullerian anomaly so let us just talk about the uterine anomalies what are the important points about uterine anomalies that you should remember so remember that the most common congenital uterine anomaly okay the most common congenital uterine anomaly is a septate uterus okay so um, septate is the answer to most of your questions so you understand it, it may try to remember it that way it is the most common and also it might appear like it is a small septa but it is the one that is causing most of the problems all right so let's say septate uterus is the most common congenital uterine anomaly the most common anomaly which is causing abortion is also septate uterus again right the anomaly which is associated with infertility that is also septate if they ask you which has the worst reproductive outcome among all of these anomalies the answer is again septate right if they ask you which has the best outcome or in which surgery is not required then the answer to that is rq8 if that is not in the option then diadelphus and if that is not there then bicornuate will have the best outcome most common anomaly which is associated most commonly associated with urinary or renal abnormalities is the unicornuate uterus okay unicornuate uterus is most commonly associated with the urinary anomaly so that is why it is very important that whenever there is a unicornuate uterus we perform an IVP to rule out these urinary abnormalities whenever there is a unicornuate uterus it is associated with renal abnormalities in about 40 percent of the cases so this is important now these uterine anomalies they most of the times these uterine anomalies they most of the times these uterine anomalies cause the most common presentation 
the most common presentation of these uterine anomalies is actually second trimester abortion second trimester recurrent abortion or habitual abortion this is the most common presentations okay but if they ask you one anomaly which can cause one anomaly which can cause first trimester abortion then the answer to that question is septate uterus okay so overall the most common presentation is second trimester recurrent abortions but the one anomaly which can cause first trimester abortion is capable of causing first trimester abortion is a septate uterus the other abnormalities will not give rise to the will not give rise to the first trimester abortions okay so this is important here now another important point that we get get confused sometimes is what is the investigation of choice if they ask you investigation of choice for uterine anomalies and they are not specifying specifying anything else then the best answer is a laparoscopy plus a hysteroscopy right after that it is mri or 3d usg all right mri is generally preferred over a 3d usg but lapro hystro is the investigation of choice for uterine anomalies all right because it can be diagnostic and therapeutic in the same sitting if it is a septate uterus which is anyways the most common cause then the hysteroscopic septoplasty can be done hypotroscopic uh, hysteroscopic septum resection can be done in the same setting with the lapro hystroscopy all right so we will we can understand that a septate uterus is something like this okay this is the uterus and this is the septum all right and this is a septate uterus okay whereas a bicornuate uterus there is a dip here so this is a bicornuate uterus okay there are two cavities okay two cavities and one cervix so two cavities and one cervix whereas the uterus diadelphus on the other hand is like this okay the uterus diadelphus on the other hand is like this there is going to be two cavities yeah like this so this is the uterus diadelphus this will have the uterus diadelphus will have two cavities and two cervix two uterine cavities and two cervix all right so on hsg what will happen that the bicornuate and the septate on hsg will look the same even hysteroscopically from inside they will look the same like cavities but to differentiate between septate and bicornuate to differentiate between septate and bicornuate we need to see the fundus okay we need to see the fundus and that is why lapro plus hysteroscopy and similarly in lap plus hysteroscopy what we can do at the same time septum resection if it is found that it is a septum septum resection can be done in the same setting so this is what is important to remember in in uh, terms of septate and bicornuate uterus the investigations of choice there and another important point that you have to remember is that these abnormalities incidentally diagnosed like bicornuate uterus or uterus diadelphus intent incidentally diagnosed they need not be treated until unless they are associated with habitual abortions all right so another important point that you should remember is that that these abnormalities these abnormalities need correction only in the presence of habitual abortions okay otherwise they deserve no specific treatment if they are incidentally diagnosed so this is a very very important point that you have to remember all right now moving on to the next question
all right question number 4 follicle stimulating hormone receptors are present on theca cells granulosa cells leydig cells or basement membrane of ovarian follicle the correct answer is that they are present on the granulosa cells okay so remember that the fsh receptors they are present on the granulosa cells they are also present on the sertoli cells okay they are also present on the sertoli cells and secondly they are your lh receptors okay theca cells and leydig cells these have lh receptors okay theca cells and leydig cells they have lh receptors all right so let me just summarize here about the uh, follicle stimulating hormone here <clears throat> so what do you have to remember the fsh receptors they are present on the granulosa cells and the sertoli cells in the males and your lh receptors they are present on the theca cells they are also present on the leydig cells and they are also present on the granulosa cells okay they are also present in the granulosa cells in the late follicular phase okay in the late follicular phase so this is important point to remember that lh receptors it's easy to remember that they are present on the theca cells they are present on the leydig cells right the um, the cells that are capable of synthesizing androgens apart from that they are also present in the granulosa cells in the late follicular phase so these luteinized granulosa cells these luteinized granulosa cells in the late follicular phase they start synthesizing progesterone they start synthesizing progesterone in the late follicular phase all right so if the question is asked when is progesterone when is progesterone synthesized in the menstrual cycle then the answer is late follicular phase all right the synthesis of progesterone begins in the late follicular phase but it peaks but it peaks in the luteal phase okay but it peaks in the luteal phase and that is when 8 days after ovulation 8 days after ovulation all right 8 days after ovulation that is day 22 of the cycle that is when the progesterone production is peaking all right so now let us just talk about the menstrual cycle because menstrual cycle is a very important topic and that is why i want to give you the details of menstrual cycle that you should remember let us talk about the menstrual cycle in detail before we talk about the menstrual cycle let us talk about the two cell to gonadotropin hypothesis okay this is what this is what governs the uh, menstrual cycle and when we did that uh, when we uh, answered this question that fsh receptors are present on the granulosa cell then this is what we are talking about we are talking about the two cell to gonadotropin hypothesis which states that that like for example if this is the theca cell and if this is the granulosa cell now the theca cell has lh receptor and the granulosa cell has fsh receptor all right now theca cell under the influence of lh it forms and lh receptors are there so lh acts on the theca cells and androgens are formed okay now these androgens then move to the granulosa cell diffuse into the granulosa cells and here these androgens they are 
aromatized to estrogen by the presence of the enzyme aromatase right so another important question that you have to remember is that this enzyme aromatase that is specifically present inside the granulosa cells that is why the granulosa cells they have the capacity of aromatizing these androgens which are synthesized in the theca cells to release estrogen right and what does fsh do all this while this fsh actually acts via fsh receptors and fsh stimulates the aromatase enzyme okay this fsh stimulates this step of the aromatization of the androgen so this is about the two cell two gonadotropin hypothesis this also helps us remember another fact that the raw material for estrogen synthesis anywhere in the body is always an androgen all right so we remember that the raw material or the precursor all right or the precursor for estrogen synthesis is always an androgen okay and we also remember that what is the precursor for progesterone for progesterone the precursor is ldl cholesterol okay for progesterone the precursor is ldl cholesterol so these are two important points again to remember after doing this uh, hypothesis all right now another important thing is that you have to remember about the menstrual cycle is that so this is about the two cell tonogonadotropin hypothesis now what else in the menstrual cycle what else in the menstrual cycle you have to remember is that it all begins with the primordial follicle okay it all begins from the from the primordial follicle the primordial fo follicle forms the primary follicle and then it will form the antral follicle and preantral follicles and then antral follicles and finally the graafian follicle okay this graafian follicle is the pre ovulatory follicle pre ovulatory follicle all right now from here till here okay from the primordial follicle to the preantral follicle here also there is another follicle preantral follicle here this all the step steps are gonadotropin independent okay so they proceed without the presence of fsh so very very important point that the initial part of uh, follicular development from the primordial till the preantral or till the antral it is gonadotropin independent till the antral follicle this much part is gonadotropin independent all right then the time taken sometimes question is asked that the time taken from the primordial follicle to this graafian follicle stage this is 85 days okay this is 85 days okay this is 85 days from the primordial follicle to the graafian follicle the follicular development takes 85 days another important point to remember then what is important to remember is that these antral follicles they are recruited because these antral follicles they start having fsh receptors in the granulosa cells of these antral follicles they have fsh receptors so a number of antral follicles are recruited all right so if we make a flow chart and see how it goes about we will notice that what happens is that a number of antral follicles they are recruited okay so these antral follicles they are recruited they have fsh all right so what happens that fsh acts on these antral follicles and these antral follicles and the granulosa cells of these antral follicles these synthesize estradiol and inhibin all right they start synthesizing estradiol and inhibin sorry inhibin and very important to remember that this inhibin is inhibin b very very important point to remember that the inhibin that the isoform of inhibin which is synthesized by the granulosa cells is inhibin b so what happens is that these grand antral follicles are recruited the granulosa cells from the antral follicle start synthesizing estradiol and inhibin now these estradiol levels are still in low amounts they are rising amounts of estradiol but still in low amounts what they do they cause feedback and inhibin b causes negative 
feedback inhibition okay it causes negative feedback inhibition and then fsh is decreased when fsh is decreased what happens is that that the follicles so many follicles four five six a number of follicles were recruited all right now when fsh is decreased the support to these follicles to grow is lost right so what happens that the lesser follicles the follicles which are not too good the lesser follicles they undergo a undergo atresia but there is one follicle which persists to grow despite these decreasing levels of fsh all right so one follicle which is the dominant follicle dominant follicle it continues to grow it continues to grow because it has the maximum number of fsh receptors so that is why what happens that even with decreasing fsh levels what happens that this dominant follicle continues to grow because this dominant follicle has the maximum number of fsh receptors so we see that we initially began with four to five follicles but now we are having only one dominant follicle because at the end of the day we want only one follicle which is the dominant follicle to mature now this dominant follicle what it does next is that this dominant follicle starts synthesizing increasing amounts of estradiol okay this dominant follicle starts in uh, synthesizing increasing amounts of estradiol and that leads to something which is called as the estradiol peak so this estradiol peak important point to remember is happens 24 to 36 hours prior to ovulation okay this happens 24 to 36 hours prior to ovulation and very very important point about this estradiol peak is that what it does next is that very importantly this estradiol peak should last the characteristics that are that it should last for at least 50 hours and peak levels of 200 picogram per ml should be achieved to be able to lead to lh surge and this lh surge again important question happens 34 to 36 hours prior to ovulation all right after lh surge what happens is lh peak lh peak happens 10 to 12 hours prior to ovulation so this is very important and what this lh peak or lh surge does what it does is that what does it lead to this lh surge lh peak all of this leads to very importantly resumption of meiosis 1 okay so we remembered and we try to remember what that at birth all right first of all we remember first of all we remember what do we remember that uh, oogenesis happens even in the intrauterine life okay so first important point that we have to remember is that oogenesis oogenesis starts in the intrauterine life itself okay so once oogenesis starts all the oocytes they are arrested at the primary oocytes at birth okay they those are arrested in the dictyotin of prophase they are arrested in dictyotin state of prophase okay so there are primary oocytes at birth they are arrested in the dictyotin phase so this dictyotin phase Uh, of meiosis 1 okay now this resumption of meiosis 1 happens uh, you know just prior to ovulation and what because of lh surge and what happens is that resumption of meiosis 1 secondary oocyte is formed and what happens is that the first polar body is released okay so if they ask you this question that when is the first polar body release so the first polar body is released just prior to ovulation this happens just prior to ovulation all these uh, things are happening just all these events are happening just prior to ovulation is the first polar body released all right so when is the second polar body released the next question that comes to mind is what happens when is the second polar body released 
or when is the meiosis 2 completed all these questions this happens at the time of fertilization okay so at the time of fertilization what happens is that the secondary oocyte now forms the ova and the second polar body is released okay so this happens meiosis 2 is completed the secondary oocyte was arrested in the metaphase this has was arrested in the metaphase arrest of meiosis 2 right that is completed at the time of fertilization so we understand another important point about this uh, reductions division is that your meiosis 1 is dependent on hormone okay meiosis 1 is hormone dependent because LH surge is required to initiate meiosis 1 whereas your meiosis 2 is not hormone dependent it is dependent on fertilization it is not dependent on any hormone all right so this is what happens during up till ovulation okay so up till ovulation this is what happens then another important point about menstrual cycle that you have to remember so so far we have traced the development of the follicle and we have traced the development of the follicle all the way up to ovulation what happens all right so after ovulation what happens after ovulation what happens after ovulation what happens is the corpus luteum is left behind okay corpus luteum is left behind right this corpus luteum is left behind and very importantly you have to remember that this corpus luteum is formed by the luteinized granulosa cells mainly all right and it secretes this corpus luteum secretes progesterone it also secretes estrogen it also secretes your relaxin all right it secretes progesterone estrogen relaxin and inhibin a very very important inhibin a okay very important so the form of isoform that is secreted by granulosa cells is inhibit b and the form that is secreted by corpus luteum is inhibit a the function of both these isoforms is the same that is to inhibit fsh production so that is to inhibit fsh the fun okay the function is the same so this is important point number one point number two what does the corpus luteum secrete another important point is that the maximum activity of corpus luteum happens eight days after ovulation so like i told you peak progesterone production if they ask you what is the peak when does the peak progesterone uh, production takes place or when is the maximum activity of corpus luteum taking place they're asking the same thing that is eight days after ovulation right in the non-pregnant state in the non-pregnant state the corpus luteum is maintained by LH and in the pregnant state the corpus luteum is maintained by beta HCG another important point if they ask you what is the lifespan of corpus luteum in the non-pregnant state it is around 10 to 12 days after 10 to 12 days corpus luteum undergoes spontaneous uh, luteolysis right so another important point that we come to uh, another important point that we come to know from this is that the it is the luteal phase of the menstrual cycle luteal phase of the menstrual cycle which is fixed and it is the follicular phase that it is varied all right so this is an important point that you have to remember another important point is the what is the next important point the next important point is lifespan of corpus luteum in the pregnant stage is around 10 weeks okay is around 10 weeks beyond 10 weeks the uh, hormonal production function in the uh, in the pregnancy is taken over by the placenta all right 
asked so if they ask you this question if they ask you this question that when does when does placenta take over corpus luteum function that is by 10 weeks okay and if they ask you earliest earliest by 8 weeks okay earliest by 8 weeks and it definitely placenta takes over by 10 weeks so earliest production of hormones by the placenta is by 8 weeks okay and definitely so by 10 weeks but if they ask you specifically earliest then the answer is 8 weeks okay so these are the important points about the menstrual cycle that you should remember all right now let us move to the next question The maneuver that is given in the image below is called what? Now this maneuver here is called the Morriso Smelly Wheat Maneuver. Okay, this is the Morriso Smelly Wheat Maneuver. This Ritzin Maneuver, there is a next question, question number 13 in your, uh, this thing, question number 13. So we are discussing question number 13 also here. Question number 13 shows the Ritzin Maneuver that is for the delivery of the head. So let me just talk about the various obstetric maneuvers that are there. Let me just talk about the various maneuvers in obstetrics and the most of these obstetric maneuvers are a part of your breech delivery okay they are a part of your breech delivery so let me talk about the breech delivery uh, in brief and what happens in the what are the obstetric maneuvers that we're talking about so the various obstetric maneuvers pertaining to breach okay so what are the important points about breach delivery that you should know that the most common position of breach okay firstly remember the most common position of breach is the left sacro anterior okay left sacro anterior is the most common position of breach and this sacrum is engaging by the this sacrum is engaging by the by trochanteric diameter okay so the sacrum engages by the by trochanteric diameter this is for the buttocks sorry buttocks are engaging by the bitrochanteric bi diameter the shoulders the shoulders they are engaging by the bisacromial diameter all right what about the head very very important point what about the head the head is engaging by the the head is engaging by the suboccipital frontal diameter very very important point to remember that the head is engaging by the suboccipital frontal diameter another important point to remember is that the head engages if the breech is engaging via the left if the breech is engaging in the left uh, oblique left sacro anterior position the head is engaging in the right oblique diameter right so the head is engaging in the right oblique diameter whereas the breech or the buttocks they are engaging in the left oblique diameter okay so these are the important points about the breech positions okay when we are talking about labor of the breech positions all right now what about the obstetric maneuvers so there are few obstetric maneuvers for the delivery of the after coming head 
Okay, so delivery of the hafta coming head, the first maneuver we saw that was the Morris or smelly wheat, that is one. Okay, this Morris or smelly wheat is also known as Mellar flexion and shoulder traction. Okay, this malar flexion and shoulder traction is also modified Morisot smelly wheat. All right. Then the other maneuvers of our after coming head is the burn Marshall method. Okay, the other method is use the use of Piper's forceps. Piper's forceps can also be used. Make sure that you are seeing all these pictures of the burn Marshall method of the Piper's forceps. And the other maneuver is the Prague's maneuver. There is another maneuver which is called the Prague's maneuver. Prague's maneuver is for delivery of head in the dorso posterior position. When the back is turned, fetal back is turned behind, that is called as dorso posterior position, and then we use the Prague's maneuver that is for the after coming head in the breeches. All right. Another important point is sometimes the head gets stuck. Sometimes this after coming head gets stuck, then we can use the Drusian's incision. Okay, Drusian's incision is given on the cervix and it is given at 2 o'clock or 11 o'clock position. All right, and that can widen the cervical area and lead to delivery. So this is about the maneuvers of the after coming head for breach. Duchenne's incision is not a maneuver but it is, I am specifying it here because it can be, it's a useful uh, step and obviously question can be asked on Duchenne's incision where it is used. Now what are the other maneuvers of breach? The other maneuvers of breach are there is, uh, there is a maneuver for extended arms okay the maneuver for extended arms is called as lofsets maneuver right then there is maneuver for extended legs okay extended legs means straight legs all right so like that is seen in frank breech extended legs are seen in frank breech Okay, what is done? It is done Pinard's maneuver. So you can remember this by P for Pinard's and P for popliteal fossa. So a finger is, you know, a finger is just pressed onto the popliteal fossa and that liberates the extended legs, that flexes the extended legs and then the feet is grasped and it is delivered. That is called as the Pinard's maneuver. Then for buttocks, the maneuver for delivery of buttocks is called as groin traction. All right, so this is another maneuver for breach. Then another maneuver which is very, very important, another maneuver which is important and which I want to emphasize here are your Leopold's maneuver. Why I want to emphasize on the Leupold's maneuver because this was a recently asked question, figure based question about the Leupold's maneuver where what was asked was the, there are four Leupold maneuvers to, in total, four Leupold's maneuver. So one is the, you have the fundal grip, you have the lateral grip, right? Then you have the, so this was the first Leupold, second Leupold, third Leupold maneuver was the polyg grip. So remember it is the third Leupold maneuver which is the polyg grips on which the figure based question was asked. It is done using a single hand. Okay, so if in the picture there is a single hand, it is the polyg grips and then comes your the pelvic grip which is the fourth grip in which both hands are used in the pelvic grip, right? Another important point that you should remember about the polyg grips is that in polyg, the tra in transverse lie, in transverse lie, the polyg grip is empty. 
okay in transverse lie pollic grip is empty okay because the fetus is like this and the pollic grip is performed here so this grip is empty okay so in transverse lie the pollic grip is empty this is another important concept to remember another important point to remember okay so now we have this here so Leupold maneuver is was the one recently asked question which was there okay so this is summarizing um, the maneuvers which are most of them they are used in breach and Leupold's maneuver we have I have summarized here for you so these are important maneuvers that you should remember before going into your exams all right now let us move on to the next question the next question is question number six and question number seven all right question number six and question number seven during pregnancy cardiac output peaks at which gestational age the correct answer is option b it peaks at 28 weeks and at full term pregnancy all of the following parameters are raised except is it blood volume is it minute ventilation is it glomerular filtration rate you should remember that all of these are raised even cardiac output is raised in pregnancy right but at full term what happens because at full term the gravid uterus you know the gravid uterus presses on to the inferior vena cava okay what happens that the gravid uterus it presses on the inferior vena cava and that causes decreased venous return and that decreased venous return leads to a fall in cardiac output a little fall in cardiac output at term all right this is also responsible for the supine hypotension syndrome which is sometimes seen in pregnant women supine hypotension syndrome okay so this is important that although all parameters are increased in pregnancy but cardiac output slightly falls uh, uh, cardiac output slightly falls okay so what did i uh, what was i telling you what happens is that the gravid uterus the gravid uterus was pressing on the uh, presses on the inferior vena cava and what it does it leads to decreased venous return and that causes slightly fall in cardiac output in the later part of pregnancy near term all right this is also responsible for the supine hypotension syndrome this is also responsible for supine hypotension syndrome so though cardiac output increases in pregnancy but it slightly falls at around the point of term and the maximum increase in cardiac output happens at around 28 weeks now i cannot emphasize enough or um, very very important topic is maternal adaptation to pregnancy all aspects of it especially for your PGI exam they definitely so they always ask a question on maternal adaptation to pregnancy so now I'm just going to give you two brief flowcharts which will help you to remember maternal adaptation in pregnancy and the important points that I'm going to discuss there all right so two brief flow charts and you should be sorted for answering the maternal adaptation in pregnancy so just let us briefly talk about the maternal adaptation to pregnancy okay this is a very very important topic which is maternal adaptation to pregnancy this is a very very important topic in obstetrics especially for your PGI exams and also for your AIMS exams which are concerned so what happens in maternal adaptation of pregnancy you should remember that in maternal adaptation to pregnancy is mainly to support the growing fetus and the growing demands of the mother and the fetus all right so there are metabolic demands that are need to be met okay so metabolic demands need to be met okay and another thing is that there is another parallel circulation which is going to form inside the mother's body which is the fetal circulation now the mother's heart has to perfuse or mother's blood has to perfuse her own body systems as well as 
another living thing growing inside that is the placenta and the baby so now the mother has to increase her blood volume so another thing that is happening is the increase in blood volume why this increase so these are the two major pillars of changes that are happening increase in blood volume and the metabolic demands that need to be met because all those metabolic demands which are being raised tissues are being synthesized fetus nutrient demands are being met all those things require energy for energy it needs oxygen oxygen will be transported by blood so everything is has to happen in synchronicity to help mother adapt to the increasing requirement of pregnancy which puts a load on each and every system of the mother and mother's each and every body system for example let's say if you need more oxygen to be to need to increase to the to meet the metabolic demands of the going fetus fetus needs oxygen all the processes all the energy transfer processes ions are transferred everything but tissues are growing needs oxygen right and to breathe more oxygen we need the it is the respiratory system which will undergo certain changes all right and again that oxygen needs to be transported via increased amounts of blood volume that is going to increase why this in, is increasing because it is perfusing the placenta this is perfusing the placenta and it is also supplying the fetus and various organs where blood flow is increasing all right all right but what we have to remember in increasing in this blood volume is that this increase in blood volume happens about 30 to 40 percent all right increase in plasma volume happens about 40 to 50 percent all right so there is more increase in plasma as compared to the hemoglobin but there is an increase in hemoglobin amount the increase in hemoglobin amount is only about or increase in hemoglobin amount or rbc mass okay increase in hemoglobin amount or rbc mass is only about 20 to 30% okay so this increase in plasma volume is more than the increase in rbc mass which is only 30 20 to 30% so what this leads to is a is hemodilution what this leads to is hemodilution okay another important point that you have to remember that what are the metabolic demands when we talk about the metabolic demands you have to talk about the demands of oxygen the demands of nutrients like glucose iron calcium right glucose iron calcium and in other and there is increased thyroid demands okay so there are nutrient demands and there is thyroid demand so these are the three major things that we will talk about now this let's talk about the increased oxygen demands okay so what are these reflected as why why does this increase oxygen demand is there so there is you have to remember that there is an increasing demand for oxygen there is an increasing demand oxygen demand there is an increasing oxygen demand so why is it there because of increase bmi you can remember it is the bmi that is increasing by about 25% all right there is increased oxygen consumption all right and you have to remember that the oxygen carrying capacity also increases the oxygen carrying capacity also increases because there is hemoglobin amount is increasing however the hemoglobin concentration is falling okay the total hemoglobin amount is increasing that is why the oxygen capacity carrying capacity is increasing but the hemoglobin concentration is falling there is a physiological anemia okay because of hemodilution 
there is a physiological anemia because of hemodilution. So, despite the increased oxygen capacity, despite the increased amount in hemoglobin, the hemoglobin concentration is falling. All right. So, this is another important thing that you have to remember. Secondly, there is decreased oxygen AV. AV is arteriovenous differentiation. Because of this increasing oxygen capacity, the blood is more oxygenated. So, there is decreased oxygen arteriovenous difference. Okay. So, these are the four important points that you have to remember about the metabolic demands or the oxygenation. All right. Now, another important thing, let us come back to the, if we are done, done through with this limb of the flow chart, let us come to this where I talked about this increasing blood volume. Now, all this increasing blood volume has to be accommodated in the venous system of the mother. All right. All this has to be accommodated in the venous system of the mother. So, what happens? What happens is this this increasing blood volume, you have to remember that this increasing blood volume which had which was arising, this increasing blood volume has to be accommodated somewhere, right? It has to be accommodated in the venous system, in the circulating system. And how does it that happen? That happens by decreasing the peripheral vascular resistance. Okay. So, because of this, this will happen because of this will happen because of decreasing peripheral vascular resistance. So, when the peripheral vascular resistance is going to be decreasing, there the increased amount of blood volume will be going to be accommodated. So, we understand another important point that we remember is that there is decreased peripheral vascular resistance. Vascular resistance is decreased in all the systems. If be it peripheral vascular, be it pulmonary, be it skin, skin circulation, be it renal circulation, all these vessels, they are dilated. There is vasodilation of all of these vessels and the responsible agents are estrogen, progesterone, relaxin. These are the important agents. All right. There is angiotensin refractiveness. There is angiotensin refractoriness. And that happens due to progesterone. This is progesterone related. All of these decreasing peripheral vascular changes, all these things, what they do, they contribute to decreasing BP. Another very important aspect of maternal adaptation to pregnancy is decreasing BP. And the nadir, the lowest point of this decreasing BP happens at 24 to 26 weeks, right? This is decreasing BP. Systolic BP. Uh, is also decreased, diastolic BP is also decreased, but remember that the diastolic BP is decreased more, okay. The diastolic BP is decreased more as compared to the systolic BP. Mean arterial pressure also falls, decreases. What is important is that, 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 that the CVP, the central venous pressure has no change. Okay. Central venous pressure has no change. Okay. All right. So now let us talk about the system wise. All right. Let us talk about the system wise changes. Let us talk about the all this increasing blood volume blood volume is increased, all the, the BP is decreasing. Now to maintain the perfusion of the organs and in response to increasing blood volume, it puts a load on the cardiovascular system of the mother. So what are the cardiovascular changes, important cardiovascular changes you should remember? The cardiovascular changes in pregnancy that you should remember. Important is that these cardiovascular changes, the cardiac output, it increases by 40 percent, okay, increases by 40 percent, important. And this starts increasing at five weeks, starts at five weeks, okay, and it increases by 40 percent. It reaches a maximum at 28 to 32 weeks. If you have to choose one, it is 28 weeks. 
then uh, if you have to choose one it is 28 weeks like in the question so cardiac output increases by 40 percent another important fact is that the heart rate also increases and at term it is about 20 percent higher right and the stroke volume is also increases okay so stroke volume is also increased so what is important to remember is that cardiac output increases the maximum is at 28 to 32 weeks and then another 50 percent then another it increases by 50 percent 50 percent increase during labor with each contraction and there is an additional 80 percent increase immediate postpartum okay so what we see that sometimes they ask this question that when is the chances of chances of heart failure chances of heart failure they are maximum when they are maximum immediate postpartum then intrapartum and then at 28 weeks of pregnancy right so the chances of heart failure are maximum at immediate postpartum immediate postpartum then intrapartum and then antepartum and in antepartum also at around 28 to 32 weeks the chances of heart failure are maximum so this is important about the cardiovascular changes another important point is that usually the uh, you know heart will move uh, there is usually you know uh, uh, the apex beat the apex beat of the heart usually shifts to the fourth intercostal space and it is to the it is lateral to the mid clavicular line because there is lifting of the uh, lifting of the heart because of the elevation of the diaphragm because because of the elevation of diaphragm that is happening okay there is elevation of diaphragm that is why apex beat is shifted to the left but very importantly that these are not this is not an abnormal finding in pregnancy what is abnormal so you have to remember what is abnormal so we remember that uh, um, that a diastolic murmur a diastolic murmur and a systolic murmur which is grade 3 or more these or and cardiomegaly these three things they are definitely abnormal okay a raised jvp is definitely abnormal okay these four things they are definitely abnormal right so a systolic murmur which is grade 3 or more is definitely abnormal normally there can be a systolic murmur which is grade 1 or 2 that can be a normal pregnancy finding but a systolic murmur which is grade 3 or more is definitely abnormal cardiomegaly is definitely abnormal okay straightening of left heart border straightening of left heart border right a systolic murmur which is less than uh, grade 3 less than grade 3 right um, splitting of s2 sorry s1 these can be normal findings okay so this is what is important to remember about the cardiovascular changes okay now let us talk about the respiratory changes okay what happens to the respiratory system changes okay now in the respiratory system what happens is obviously a mother has to breathe more oxygen okay breathe more oxygen because she has to increase the oxygenation of the increasing amount of hemoglobin mass and the rbc mass so more oxygen is required now keep in mind that in the one on one hand there is more oxygen required on the other hand the respiratory rate remains the same 
the respiratory rate remains the same so how is oxygenation increased by taking deep breaths by taking deep breaths how do, what does that mean that tidal volume is increased so there is deep breathing all right there is deep breathing but the respiratory remains the same there is deep breathing this is progesterone related you know uh, stimulation of the central uh, nervous system that leads to um, increased tidal volume and minute ventilatory volume minute volume that is increased and inspiratory capacity is increased so these three things are increased and respiratory rate remains the same now whenever we are deep breathing what happens whenever we are breathing deep what happens whenever there is deep breathing there is carbon dioxide wash out so carbon dioxide wash out that leads to respiratory alkalosis right now in spite of this respiratory alkalosis remember that the ph of the blood remains the same so ph remains the same means that this respiratory alkalosis is compensated all right so this there is respiratory alkalosis there is carbon dioxide washout that means there is decreased pco2 but it is compensated how because the kidneys the kidneys they excrete bicarbonate right so kidneys excrete bicarbonate so kidneys excretion of bicarbonate increases all right so this is three important points to remember that there is respiratory alkalosis which is mild but it is compensated because the kidney kidneys excrete more bicarbonate all right another important point about the re, about the um, respiratory system is that there is elevation of the diaphragm all right so when the diaphragm is lifted up all right because of the growing size of the uterus the diaphragm is lifted up right so all the expiratory volumes because of the elevation of the diaphragm and the relative compression of the chest the diaphragm is lifted up and the chest is also lifted up accordingly to that okay so all the expiratory volumes they are decreased so we remember that the frc is decreased the residual volume is decreased and the expiratory reserve volume all of these are decreased so this you have to remember and what other thing that you have to remember is that the total lung capacity is either decreased or it remains the same okay the total lung capacity either decreases or it increases the same why because though the diaphragm because though the diaphragm it rises by rises by 4 cm but you know there is also increase in the transverse diameter of the chest by 2 cm all right so the tlc it either decreases or it remains the same other things that will remain the same is the vital capacity which remains the same that you should remember and the first vital capacity they also remain the same so these are the three important things which remain the same that you should remember all right so the all the expiratory volumes they are decreased the tidal volume minute ventilatory volume inspiratory capacity these things are increased to begin with the respiratory rate remained remain the same and the total lung capacity the vital capacity and the forced vital capacity they remain the same so these are the important things that you should remember now let us talk about the renal system all right because kidneys play an important role in the maintenance of the fluid balance there are certain changes in the renal system because renal system manages changes like salt and water retention right so we know that in pregnancy there is salt and water retention all right we know in pregnancy that there is salt and water retention and we also know that the water is retained more the water is retained more as compared to salt and both of these will happen via the manipulation of the renal system right so salt retention means that there is sodium and potassium retention okay so if there is sodium and potassium retention 
their concentration does it increase no but their concentration in serum it remains the same right so sodium and potassium are being retained but the concentration in serum remains the same why because water is retained more all right so there is sodium and water retention and concentration serum remains the same another important thing is that their excretion is unchanged okay their excretion is one chain what do i mean by that by that i mean the ions they are filtered more they are absorbed more so in a nutshell their excretion remains unchanged their concentration in serum remains the same but they are absorbed more they are retained more in absolute numbers so what happens in the renal system why are these ions they are filtered more i told you that there is blood flow is increasing to all the organs so similarly the renal blood flow and the gfr they increase by about 50% okay this leads to increased frequency of micturition there is increased frequency of micturition right because of the increased jfr what will happen the creatinine clearance is also increased right creatinine clearance is increased so the serum creatinine and the serum uric acid levels they are lower they are decreased there is glycosuria which can be normal in pregnancy but then obviously it has to be evaluated further kidneys they increase in size kidneys they increase in size by around 1 cm there is hydroureter right more than left there is hydroureter right more than left all right so these are the important renal changes that you should remember all right another important point is that despite this increased uh, you know um, so these are the important changes that you should remember secondly let's talk about the hematological changes let's talk about the hematological changes okay talking about the hematological changes we saw, we discussed that the hb concentration it decreases the platelet count also decreases right these are the two things that decrease remember the total iron binding capacity right remember that the total iron binding capacity that increases okay so hp concentration decreases total iron binding capacity increases but your mchc remains the same okay mchc mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration remains the same this is an important point the other features are like that of physiological anemia where the hb concentration is decreasing and the tibc is increasing all right another important point is that the tlc increases all clotting factors they increase except factor 11 and 13 okay total proteins they increase but the plasma protein concentration decreases because of hemodilution okay so these are the important points that you have to remember about the hematological changes all right now let us just talk about three other more important uh, metabolic requirements and that would finish our flow chart one is glucose requirement one is for the thyroid hormone requirement and one is the calcium metabolism okay so talking about glucose metabolism important point is that there is insulin resistance in pregnancy this insulin resistance 
mainly is because of human placental lactogen mainly but other hormones like estrogen progesterone relaxin cortisol all these are contributing prolactin all these hormones are contributing but the main thing that is contributing is the human placental lactogen because of this insulin resistance what is there there is hyperinsulinemia okay hyperinsulinemia what happens because of this insulin resistance there is hyperinsulinemia and that leads to hyper triglyceridemia and fat deposition this hyperinsulinemia leads to fat deposition okay this insulin resistance contributes to postprandial hyperglycemia right post prandial hyperglycemia so that all the glucose is shunted towards the fetus and overnight consumption of glucose by the fetus leads to fasting hypoglycemia so these are the important points that you should remember in the glucose metabolism that there is insulin resistance which is maximum at around 24 weeks right mainly contributed by human placental lactogen there is hyperinsulinemia there is postprandial hyperglycemia and fasting hypoglycemia and there is fat deposition and hypertriglyceridemia as far as your thyroid hormone metabolism is concerned the important points that you should remember is that thyroid production hormone production is increased all right there is increased in increased in total t3 and t4 all right that leads to decrease in tsh right but the free t3 and t4 free t3 and free t4 they remain the same why because the sex hormone binding globulin levels they increases so the sex hormone binding globulin binds to the free form so the free forms they are maintained at the same level but the total production is increased and because the total production is increased that there is decreased tsh okay so these are the four important uh, nutshell uh, points that you should remember about thyroid metabolism coming back to the calcium metabolism in calcium metabolism you have to remember that the fetus accrues around 30 grams of calcium the fetus needs around 30 grams of calcium to build its own skeletal system so what it does fetus is going to extract out the calcium even if the mother does not take it right so what does the mother do the mother has to increase the calcium absorption from the gut so there is increased calcium absorption from the gut and that happens how because of increased activity of vitamin d3 active vitamin d3 dihydroxy vitamin d3 levels those are increased and this has this act increase activity of vitamin d3 should happen in response to parathormone but you will realize that the parathormone levels they actually decrease in pregnancy so what is responsible for this increasing vitamin d3 levels these happen because of the increased levels of parathormone related peptide which are synthesized from the placenta okay i am uh, i think i'm just so there is increased vitamin d3 levels let me just repeat this point here increased vitamin d3 levels this happens despite the parathormone levels which are decreasing in pregnancy okay parathormone levels are actually decreasing in pregnancy so why does this increase in vitamin 3 happens because of increased parathormone related peptide which is synthesized from the placenta and this increased parathormone related peptide is responsible for the increasing vitamin d3 levels all right so these are the important points and uh, we have clubbed together the very very important points all right about the metabolic changes in pregnancy all right
all right now let us come to the next question which is question number eight okay question number eight are sacrospinous fixation is for strengthening the apical defect posterior defect lateral defect or anterior defect now what are these defects that they are talking about they are defect they are defective defects in the connective tissue endopelvic connective tissue fascia that is surrounding the um, genital organs and so sacrospinous fixation is for strengthening the apical defect what it does is that it is a surgery done for vault prolapse okay it can be done for a strengthening of the vault also strengthening or suspension of the vault also suspension it can be done so sacrospinous fixation this sacrospinous fixation okay this is done for vault prolapse okay it can also be done as for suspension of vault suspension of vault uh, in hysterectomy surgeries to prevent future vault prolapse so what it does is that this vault this vault is suspended to this ischial spine right it is suspended to the ischial spine here and that is what happens in sacrospinous fixation all right that sacrospinous fixation the vault is fixed to the level of the ischial spine and once you fix it to the level of the ischial spine the apical defect the apical defect is corrected okay this is what you have to remember now let us move on to the next question question number 9 question number 9 question number 9 uh, let us see this the contraception method shown below is made up of a quinacrine pellet is it made up of molybdenum quinacrine pellet will nng or nickel so this is nickel titanium alloy all right this is nickel titanium alloy this method is basically hysteroscopic tubal occlusion right this is hysteroscopic tubal occlusion hysteroscopically these are you know um, spiral shaped uh, uh, rods spirally curved rods which are inserted into the uh, tubal ostia via the tubal ostia they are inserted under hysteroscopic guidance and this method is also called as a sure okay this method is also called as assure this is a contraception method for hysteroscopic tubal occlusion which is shown in this figure all right moving on to the next question <clears throat> 